Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. Better watch out, motherfucker! Released direct to standard definition video in 1989. This film gives us the conclusion of the Billy slash Ricky Chapman trilogy, and unlike part two, is actually a fully filmed feature length original movie. And although Eric Freeman's crazy ass doesn't return as Ricky, we trade him out for Bill Friggin Mosley, legend of the horror genre, best known for playing Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. But those two promising facts can't fix what is one of the most boring and lackluster movies I've ever covered on the Kill Count. Like yeah, it's a full 90 minutes, but it might as well be a 20 minute short for all that happens in it. The gist of it is that Ricky, looking like a Venture Bros character with his brain exposed, is chasing after a blind girl with psychic powers. Again, sounds like it could be fun, right? I assure you, it is not. But hey, after this, we get some really fun weird shit in parts 4 and 5, including the triumphant return of Clint Howard to the channel. So just bear with me for this movie, and join me as I count the kills. The movie begins with our final girl Laura waking up to a voice calling her name. She's dressed to be a background actor in a Madonna video and is in an all-white room that apparently also holds a hospital bed, upon which lies Bill Mosley with his brain exposed. He wakes up and pulls out a stabby slashy scalpel, but Laura escapes him and runs through a bunch of blindingly white hallways. Jeez, I've heard of a white Christmas before, but this is ridiculous. Eventually, she enters a room where King Chris the Kringle sits upon his throne, and ladies love a man in power, so she hops right up and tells him her desires. I want a Barbie doll. And? And bicycle. And? And roller skate. And? And ballet shoes. And? And a Mickey Mouse watch. Okay, lady, that's enough. Okay, you know what? How about a bloody fucking knife? How's that sound for a Christmas gift? Turns out our selfish heroine was just having a nightmare in a hospital setting. In the real world, she's blind and under the care of Dr. Newberry, who I hear is the richest man in Twin Peaks. He gets pretty pumped when she tells him about her Santa Claus dream. I think she made contact. It's not that hard, dude. All you gotta do is write a letter to the North Pole. Looks like she and Ricky, who's chilling there in a coma, are hooked up to each other somehow, which is why she's able to see his memory in the form of <sighs> flashbacks from the original. I hope those actors in part one got some damn residuals for these sequels. But a shared mental experience is exactly what Dr. Newberry wants. Well, that and the name of the shampoo you use, girl. Your hair smells so fine. Mm. Although Ricky's flashback memories are vivid and also terrifying for Laura, she's unable to give Dr. Newberry any satisfying science data, and on her way out for the holidays, she tells him that she doesn't want to be his little sleep princess anymore. He tries some reverse psychology on her. Certain psychic abilities can be frightening. I'm not scared. And wow, that apparently worked. We'll talk about it after Christmas. Damn, dude, I guess you know your patients pretty well. Her body may be young, but her soul is old. Oh, okay, maybe a little too well. He's off there, Chief. She'll be back. And then she'll let me go as deep as I want. Yo, dude, phrasing. She likes it. I mean, loves it. Could you please just. She can't resist it. What are you even talking about, man? She wants to penetrate his mind. Oh, skull fucking the serial killer. Okay, that's cool then. Out in the main hospital area, Laura asks a receptionist to let her know when her brother arrives to pick her up. I'm very busy, miss. Uh, yeah, and I'm very blind. Could you please just give me a heads up when he gets here? Shit. Her brother Chris is equally 80s in his attire and can probably relate to Ricky pretty well, since he's played by Eric DeRay, who spent a whole season of Twin Peaks also in a coma. The two of them have a loving sibling relationship where they're comfortable telling weird jokes. You know how Pea Brain gets his belt off? How? <laughs> <He's sick. laughs> I mean, you are a little bit, but it's still funny. The hospital has a Santa Claus to visit patients, and in accordance with horror movie rules, the dude's a big old pervert. Put a lick by candy cane, little girl. Oh my god, dude. By the same slasher Santa statue, dude is also an alcoholic and just an out and out asshole. Hey, vegetable! Who's your favorite singer? So obviously, his role in this system of cinema is to be the first victim. Ricky wakes up and approaches the Santa for a real awful first person kill as the Santa does some shitty improv. Hey Ricky, uh, you know about the broccoli, I was just kidding. Ending with a classic yell of no to the camera. We do get to see his body on the ground though, when Ricky is confirmed to be awake and ready to kill some more. Though he didn't take the Santa outfit because... 
Wait, why didn't he take the Santa outfit? What happened to the killer Santa conceit? Laura meets with a psychiatrist and they talk about ESP, since Laura occasionally has creepy visions like seeing the hospital receptionist get murdered. He tells her it's because she's too hard on herself and needs to let people help her. Who said you have to be the world's champion blind orphan? Well, she doesn't want to settle for second place blind orphan, dude. That's the first loser blind orphan. Besides, her visions are actually legit, as the hospital receptionist is quickly dispatched by the newly awakened Ricky in, yep, you guessed it, another kill where the victim just screams in to the camera. Oh, but at least this one has a ketchup bottle blood effect. Hey, uh, Jim, could you spray some more ketchup there? Yeah, there you go. Much better. Chris tries to introduce his girlfriend Jerry to his sister, but Laura's less than friendly. Chris tells me you're psychic. Chris tells me you give great head. Don't worry, Jerry. Laura's probably just upset that the two of you look exactly the same. Seriously, I'd have a hard time keeping them separate if it wasn't for the fact that Jerry is played by Laura freaking Haring, who was Rita and Camilla in the terrifying mindfuck Mulholland Drive. This movie's like a David Lynch project, just without anything good in it. They take off for Piru, California, where their grandmother lives, and Ricky discovers the directions when he telepathically intercepts the trio doing a Californian sketch. Take the 5 onto the 126, and then you turn left. Forget the map. Take the 101 to Park Road. Personally, I'd split the difference and take the 27 to the 118 and then get off at Princeton Ave, but really it depends on what day it is. Laura falls asleep in the car so she can have some flashbacks to help pad out this piece of shit, while Ricky ends up hitchhiking to Piru in a shot that reminds me of that stupid ghost dude at the end of Pet Cemetery. The guy who picks him up gives Ricky a festive holiday sweater to wear, but Ricky is committed to having an anti-Christmas appearance in this movie, so he leaves the sweater and the guy's corpse behind as he steals the truck and the dude's street clothes. Man, Ricky, pulling a real Michael Myers there, huh? But at least that shot of the truck pulling away was somewhat interesting, which is more than I can say for most of this movie. For instance, it's better than this 20 second shot of Laura drinking from a water bottle. See, you don't even need flashbacks to pad the shit out of this movie. During Ricky's road trip, we get another body for the count with one of those awful into the camera kills, this time of a gas station attendant who dies while his girlfriend waits for him to come back to the phone. Sorry, lady, he's not gonna be able to give you any full-on phone sex anymore. But maybe he could interest you in a little bit of phone head. Ricky inexplicably beats the kids to grandma's house, but it's weird that she didn't see it coming since she's apparently psychic too. Phone's gonna ring? I don't know, maybe it doesn't work like that. Grandma's real nice to the silent chrome-domed Ricky, giving him food to eat and presents to open, but either the red wrapping paper or just the festive activities in general flips the kill switch on in Ricky's exposed brain and he kills Grandma off screen as she screams. <laughs> Wow, so far, this movie's blood budget is a single bottle of ketchup. The kids arrive at Grandma's house, and since she's apparently not home, Chris and Jerry get to tongue fucking in her living room. Yo, dude, your sister's blind, not deaf. She can still hear all that spit swapping. Now, this is when this already slow movie completely grinds to a halt. Literally nothing happens after they get to Grandma's house, aside from a cramped bit of tubby time between Chris and Jerry. Seriously, we watched Laura listen to the TV for like a minute straight. At this point, I can't tell if we're watching a shitty amateur film or a late product of Italian neorealism. But either way, fuck this movie! Throughout all this, the killer's crazy doctor has been trying to track him down alongside a police officer. Stop me if you've heard this one before. The only notable thing during their scenes is the reminder of something I totally forgot while covering the Garbage Garbage Day movie. During these sequels, they randomly changed Ricky's last name from Chapman to Caldwell. Richard Caldwell. Wait a minute, Ricky Caldwell? Yeah, I guess they made that change in part two but the only time they noted it was during the credits. I have no idea why they did that, but my guess, they just didn't fucking care. And in case you don't believe me that their scenes are entirely pointless, here, have some sample dialogue. Well, I do get a hundred bucks off my cellular bill for every new sign-up. Wait, is he talking about cell phones in 1989? Maybe these characters really are psychic. After they find the decapitated body of the gas station attendant, the lieutenant admits that he's probably gonna fucking murder Ricky when he finds him. And Dr. Newberry doesn't like that because he wants to use Ricky for mad science. Ricky isn't a killer. He's a way to stop people from killing. Like 
Snake venom is a way to cure the bite. Good thing for him, the cop's bladder has very poor timing, and after he gets out to take a roadside piss, Newberry steals the car and drives off without him. Eventually, the kids get sick of waiting for Grandma, Godot style, and discover that their car has been messed with off screen. Something really weird is happening. We just found my car. Upside down in the orange grove. God forbid you show something that interesting on screen. Also, the phone line has been cut, and oh yeah, Ricky's at the window. And at the door. Holy shit. Yeah, holy shit. Chris stabs through Ricky's arm and gets the dude to give up his girlfriend, but then they just sit there at the door and act like nothing fucking happened. He almost killed him. <laughs> Not her he's after. Hey, I, I know you're not used to this, but something just happened in this movie. React to it. Acting is reacting. Because of the attack, Chris goes and finds his granddad's old shotgun. It's granddad's old greener. Wait, greener? How many damn firearm terms am I gonna have to learn doing this show? Now, Chris may have the greener, but Ricky is meaner. And although he's a killer, he thinks guns are for wieners. Instead, he gets his rocks off by choking Chris to the ground and stabbing him with that knife. Oh, sick. Look at all his head fluid move as he watches the girls run away. Splishy Flashy. Dr. Newberry pulls up to Grandma's house and is all like, Yo, Ricky, what up? He slowly approaches his favorite Pyrex patient and they clasp hands together. But then Ricky stabs him in the gut with his knife. Aw, oh, Ricky, you're telling me all that screen time I took up getting here was for nothing? Laura and Jerry barricade the front door with the piano, but that's not gonna help them when Ricky crashes through the back one. Wow, that is the fastest any character has ever moved in this piece of shit movie. Upstairs, Jerry goes to look for another gun that Laura told her about, only to get pulled under a bed by Ricky, who was somehow already upstairs. We see her body with some nondescript wounds on it when Laura comes and finds her a minute later. Laura feels on Ricky's face and doesn't like what she senses, so she runs away screaming. She winds up in the basement, where she starts having a telepathic conversation with her dead grandma? Oh, okay, sure, I guess. But I don't know what to do, Granny. Please help me. Use your power, child. Laura, you've switched off your targeting computer. What's wrong? Nothing, actually. She's about to use the fo- or her powers, or whatever, by knocking out the lights when she hears Ricky coming downstairs. Now we're even. I guess Ricky thinks that means he doesn't need a weapon anymore, since he sticks his knife in the wall so the next Jason player can pick it up. He attacks Laura with his bare hands and gets her to the ground, but she's saved by Chris, who I egregiously left off the kill count, so obviously you should have seen this coming. Chris shoots Ricky with the, uh, what was it again? Oh, yeah, the greener, but Ricky takes it like a champ and just gets right back up. Do greeners suck? or is this movie just stupid? Don't comment. I already know the answer to that. Ricky uses Chris's empty shotgun to choke the brother out, and I'm gonna put him on the kill count here, even though it might seem like I should. not I'll explain in a second. But first, Ricky's gotta get back to his boring pursuit of Laura. She does have a sharpened stake now, though, so maybe this ending will be interesting. Uh, what? Why did he just lie down on that stake? Why did he do that? What the fuck, movie? And let me explain why I counted Chris, but I'm not counting Ricky here. After that lieutenant dude finds his way to grandma's house, we see some paramedics loading a still-living body into an ambulance. Call ahead through intensive care to set up life support. With a little luck, we can save this guy. We never see Ricky or Chris alive again, and the movie doesn't clarify who that still-living person is. But judging by the lieutenant's reaction there, I think the movie meant for it to be Ricky, so that's why I'll count Chris as dead and Ricky is still alive. We do get one more kill, though, when the lieutenant finds Dr. Newberry lying on the ground, pretty bloody and ready to die. Got any last words for us, Doc? Don't. Hey, not bad words to live by. Maybe that was like his be good people. The movie ends with Laura hopping into a cruiser with the lieutenant, where she and a vision of Ricky wish the audience happy holidays. Merry Christmas. And a happy new year. This movie had about as much action as a Christmas greeting card, but maybe it had a decent body count. Let's find out and get to the numbers. Ho, 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 ho. There were eight victims in Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. They consisted of five dudes and three ladies, though the more interesting statistic is how many were off screen. Answer? Almost all of them. With a runtime of 89 minutes, we wound up with a kill on average about every 11 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to, uh, none of them. None of these kills deserve that award, on screen or not. I don't reward movies that don't try, and so the doll machete for lamest kill will go to all of them. Most of them are the stupid victim screaming into the camera style. One of them very obviously uses a ketchup bottle for effects, and both of the on screen ones are a big fat meh, fuck off movie. And that's it. Silent Night Deadly Night 3, Better Watch Out, was released direct to video in 1989. It ended the murder Santa part of this franchise, not with a bang but a whimper, and the following year's part 4 would be a totally unrelated and totally insane story about witches and bugs. Wait, that sounds familiar. Until then though, I'm James A. Janice. 
This has been the Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Sharon Soul and Michael Althaus. I also want to keep thanking patrons who have been with me for over a year. People like Brichard Busby, James the Ralphs 2002, Jennifer Jensen, Ethan Keenan, and Sophie Tedesco. You guys like this? A little uh, Pyrex bowl over a brain? The brain's from Night of the Living Dead. Remember that Kill Count? All right, everyone be good people.